You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have Sharon Terry. She is the CEO of Genetic Alliance, and the website is geneticalliance.org. So, Sharon, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me about uh, Genetic Alliance. What's the premise of the company? Yeah, so we are a 32-year-old nonprofit established initially to help uh, other nonprofits, disease advocacy organizations, uh, work with their members efficiently and effectively, not reinventing the wheel, that sort of thing. And then over the years, we've really kind of moved toward both policy work. We, we, the coalition that got the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act passed, and we also worked a lot with tools like registries, biobanks, essentially putting big tools into the hands of people so that citizen science and community-led science can go forward. Well, what kind of tools have you have uh, proved to be helpful over the years? Yeah, so so what we discovered early on is that every disease needs a biobank, uh, so bio, biological samples, a place to put them, a place to archive them properly and have them overseen in the right way. And then every group also needs a registry. So, in other words, a way to start to categorize what's happening in the disease, to look at uh, phenotype and genotype correlations, to look at progression of disease, uh, that sort of thing. And so the tools that we've built essentially are building that infrastructure and then providing those to these disease advocacy groups at very low cost and also helping them to not reinvent those wheels. So, for instance, um, it would be good if there was a biobank of, you know, black lungs, where we could study, you know, what happens to people that smoke long term, for instance, and those tissues right. could be sampled and kept and seen. Yep, yep, yep. Or okay. you know, and, and we will find, you know, psoriasis, and there needs to be a bank of both their skin tissue as well as their DNA, so that you could start to look at what genes are involved in psoriasis and why are some people with psoriasis having a much harder time than others? Why are some drugs working and others are not? That sort of thing. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, how many conditions do we have such a thing for, you know, so a low totally, percentage, a high percentage? Well, so <laughs> so there are 7,000 rare diseases and probably another two, 3,000 common ones. So we're looking at somewhere around sure. 10,000 diseases. And of those diseases, one could say we have a very low percentage because we're, we're somewhere around 100 conditions when we look at both the um the biobank and the registry system. We certainly hope to expand that as we're able to do better marketing. We're typical of nonprofits. We're not terribly good at communications and marketing. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, forging partnerships and looking at ways that we can get the word out that this, that these tools are available. So, so these organizations can, can find them and use them. So what's been observed in the hundred conditions or so that have tissue samples, et cetera, has that really made uh, solving those issues a lot easier or is it still a really tough thing? You know, what are maybe a, a couple of the issues and uh, that have yeah. adequate uh, tissue banking? Yeah. So, so what we found is that, that those who, for example, have done some large scale sequencing of genomes in addition to understanding the clinical manifestations of diseases are able 
uh, to better determine who responds to what kind of drug. Um, and we've seen that in a few diseases. We've seen very simple but very important things happen in some of the rare diseases. So one of them, the one that affects my children, which is why I'm uh, part of this activity at all, uh, it's called uh, the disease is pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and it causes mineralization in the back of the eye that leads to blindness uh, around age 30, so pretty young. Well, one of the things we found by looking at the data that we were collecting was that women were complaining that they had uh, biopsy every time they had a mammogram, and they were being um, looked at as though they had uh, breast cancer. And that's, you know, very troublesome and worrisome and all the rest. And through this registry system, we were able to collect data on a couple hundred women, look at their mammograms, look at the mammograms of controls, and show that, no, in fact, the disease itself was causing this mineralization. This looks like cancer, but it's not. And so they could simply tell their radiologist, I don't need a biopsy. Obviously, they bring them a paper that shows that more clearly um, to them in, in, in clinician language so that they know they're being spoken to uh, properly. But yes, we've been able to, for example, alleviate a great deal of stress there and, and unnecessary medical procedures as well. So why is this only available for, you know, 100 conditions out of 10,000? Is it just people are not aware that this would have great efficacy or is it, uh, you know, is it hard to get samples? Is permission yeah, so, an issue? You know, what are the... Yeah, like? no, no, none of that's an issue really. Um, uh, one thing I would say is that we have not done a good job telling the couple thousand advocacy groups that we work with that this is available to them. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time and energy and resources on building these infrastructures and then not a lot on communications and marketing about it being available. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, some of the disease advocacy groups stay in the advocacy arena and really look at you know, how do I support the people with this disease and don't come to a place where they start to think about, well, I could actually accelerate research if I collected clinical evidence and biological samples, that sort of stuff. So there's there's a number of groups who have not kind of gotten to that level yet. And so we actually coach them so that they can get ready to do the, the kinds of things that we've been doing. What's the process for, um, you know, for getting permission and then for banking the materials? Is it you know, is it expensive and time consuming or is it uh, all pretty simple to do? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the first times that we did this, it was very expensive and very time consuming. And now we pretty much have an add water and serve process. So we would give, you know, any disease group that came to us or any community that came to us uh, all the template documents they need to consent the people. We give them the kits to get the collection of saliva or in the old days, blood, and still some people do collect blood. Um, we have all the mailers. All that stuff is completely uh, simple now, uh, really ad water and serve system. And uh, we've made it so that it's, it's, it's kits. It's really kittable and, uh, and real easy to do. Okay. Uh, what are the uh, top conditions that, uh, you know, seem like, I mean, all conditions need attention, but, you know, what are some of the biggest bad ones that need this? Well, that's really a hard question. Um, I, I don't even know how to answer that because, I mean, one might go to diseases that are lethal and kill children. I mean, that's pretty uh, pretty mm. terrifying. On the other hand, there's, you know, diseases that cause a lot of suffering and maybe not death uh, affect children, sometimes affect adults. Uh, so I don't really have a favorite. And that's a kind of odd thing about me. Um, lots of advocates work for one disease. And I really feel like we should be working on just systems that any disease could use. And then I'm not going to be the arbiter of which diseases use it uh, or even the decider. I'll just uh, I'll just help anybody, basically. Well, it does seem that, you know, there needs to be some kind of Pareto. I mean, like, but you're right. It is hard. Someone may want to focus on diseases that affect children. Some may want to focus on cancer, you know, because they know someone that's had that. Uh, others. Right. It could be, right. you know, what are the most prevalent diseases, et cetera, that reduce quality right. of life? Hmm. Right. Yep. And then what are I, diseases that don't get a lot of attention in the rare space? And basically, I believe there actually are enough advocates for enough diseases that lots of diseases get attention and that instead what's needed is is to our tools that everybody can use. Um, <clears throat> so when you're looking at a particular disease, I mean, again, where, where does this choice come from? It has to come from somewhere. 
Yeah, so, so it's really uh, totally pushed by the mom or dad of the kid. So, you know, the mom or the dad runs a foundation called the ehlers Danlos Society, for example, a disease you've never heard of, or I could say ectodermal dysplasia, or I could say progeria, or I could say, I could say psoriasis, and you'd recognize it. And those individuals who run those organizations come to us and say, can we use your tools? And so, again, I don't make any decision about, well, I don't really think your disease is a priority. I just say, here's how you use our tools, and here's our really inexpensive way of using these tools. So the decision for prioritization is made by those individuals who have a passion for that disease and not by me. Mm, okay. Well, what's been the response, depending on the condition? Do you see a variation in it? More passion from some or others or apathy or, you know, is it Yeah. Is it equal? Yeah. So I, uh, I would say the more rare diseases have more passion, more action from their members, their patients are really driven. Nobody's paying attention to them. And so they all sign up. They all participate in registries and biobanking. Um, when you get to diseases like psoriasis, like eczema, like uh, certain l- large cancers, a celiac disease, uh, a smaller percentage of their populations participate. Now, on the one hand, that's not good, and on the other hand, it's not bad because there are so many people with those diseases. There's plenty of people participating in research, whereas the more rare diseases, you know, if there's 100 children in the world with progeria, then you want all 100 to participate so you have enough people to do some research. Okay. So how many different conditions are you, uh, you know, facilitating right now? So we actually work with about 2,000 um, and about... um, a hundred of them are participating either in the biobanking and or the um, the registry. Oh wow! Okay. Hmm. So, uh, I mean, what do you see as the uh, the real stop gaps? You mentioned communication and marketing multiple times. Is that because yep. of a lack of money? Is that because of a lack of yeah. skill? Or, you know, what's, no, what's it's a lack of money. Yeah, I mean, we are a, we're a nonprofit. Um, we try to apply for grants, and we get them sometimes. Sometimes we don't. Uh, there's not a, a really big interest from the U.S. government, for example, or from foundations in having people drive their own research. And that's what we're about. We're about, you know, we're essentially the Uber of the transportation industry. We're saying, as long as you want to just hire big taxi cab companies, you know, like academic medical centers and let them make decisions about what people should or shouldn't be doing, that's one model. And that's what the National Institutes of Health and the FDA and others use, we're saying that if every person in America had the opportunity to step forward, raise their hand, say they wanted their data contributed to research uh, and have that um, be supported, we would be able to get there quicker, faster, cheaper. And there aren't really good funding sources in the U.S. or anywhere else for the work we do. So we're really almost always um, looking for um, small bits of money to do the work we do. And, and I joke and say, you know, we basically do what we do on bake sales and car washes, uh, like lots of not, not for profits and, and haven't really uh, cracked the funding, uh, funding needs uh, problem. Mm, okay. And then again, have you seen that um, with the collection of samples and tissues and, you know, analysis and, and all that, you know, like the, some of the most fully developed conditions that have the most documentation? Any anecdotes or case studies of what it's been able to do for that condition and its treatment? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen is that uh, in some instances, and and I didn't really get permission from any of these disease groups to talk about any of this, and they always have to wait till the papers published and the academics they work with get credit. Um, But what I've seen, for example, is ways to stratify certain kinds of cancer uh, because of the information that they collected from the people with that cancer that might not be available in the clinical record. So there might be something that um, the, a symptom or a sign that individuals suffer from that the electronic health record's not picking up because it isn't something the doctor asks, but instead the per- a whole group of people experience and then the advocacy group for that disease finds out an important thing that then they work with the academics or the companies to do better drug de- de- targeting. So, you know, it might be, Uh, a drug that they thought would work for lots of people doesn't, and they're able to stratify who gets it, who doesn't get it, and it's more targeted. Um, In other cases, what we've seen is these disease groups have been able to do the preliminary work that's sort of hidden behind the scenes. Every disease, when it goes to a drug company to look for a, a treatment, needs 
what's called a biomarker or a clinical endpoint. And those are hard to discover, you know, what actually will the FDA accept as a place where um, they believe they've made a change in this disease progression or they've cured the disease or at least treated it in some way that's meaningful. And so the disease groups have been working on figuring those things out. Yeah, once a new drug or treatment comes out, what's the feedback mechanism? You know, you never hear about that. You hear like, oh, the, the FDA approved this or that. But then, I don't know, I guess it takes years to really see the efficacy and to see statistics. Oh, this, this drug lowered cholesterol by 4% and, you know, 9% of people or something. Right, exactly. And and then, you know, then you find out either years and years and years later that it didn't actually do what it said or that there were actually adverse events. People were getting more harmed than benefited. And what we've been able to do, again, with the advocacy groups, what they've done is so a drug comes out and they continue to collect data on the people taking the drug and they're able to start to amass either adverse events or signs and symptoms they didn't expect or or great benefit that shows that actually this is working better than we thought and maybe people younger should be put on it or people with milder disease should be put on it. Yeah, so all that is um, is quite significant in the sense of post-market. And the other group that's come to us that we haven't actually set up any biobanking for yet are those that are now going to be using gene therapy because the FDA is saying, you know, if a gene therapy works, then essentially someone gets treated and they never experience the disease again, uh, or for example, gene editing even more so, um, we need to follow those people and see, was it truly effective? And so the FDA in some cases is asking for registries for 15 years after the administration of either the therapy or the editing. And so uh, we mm. see that's, that our, our technology is a really good place for that. Do you see any pushback? from, you know, certain interests when it comes to a condition? So there's a unique piece of our system that does bother some um, of the academics who are involved in uh, work on those conditions. And that is our system lets every individual in the system make a decision about where their data and their sample will go. And the equivalent here is you put your money in XYZ Bank and you make a decision about whether you're going to invest it in some other, you know, mechanism like a stock or a mutual fund or a bond or whatever. Um, in most instances, we all put our data in a bank, air quotes, and the bank makes a decision. And the bank being, let's say, you know, I'm sitting in Johns Hopkins right now, and Johns Hopkins makes a decision about where all these data will go and who will use them. Um, they will make sure they don't leave the institution. And so if I'm trying to get somebody to study a certain kind of cancer with my kid, I want actually all the institutions in the United States that are mm. interested to use it. Um, and I want to make the decision that those institutions will use it and not just this one. And so we get pushback from academics that, um, you know, you're killing our model, which is essentially to hoard these data until we do the experiment and then we roll out the solution. And I'm saying, actually, this would be much faster if you collaborated with everybody who has these data around the world. Yeah, it would. And I, I totally agree. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer, and I think if the average person, I often say, you know, if I went in the grocery store and told people, actually, there are institutions hoarding your data, they would be shocked, especially around children, around cancer, around things that cause great disability, you know, people would really be uh, just shocked. Well, so your job is not only to get people to say, all right, I'll give you my data, but then, I mean, then there's, uh, once they give you the data, how do you communicate with them and say, hey, um, you know, you, you gave your data and you indicated your preferences that it would go for childhood cancers. And, oh, these two new institutions just came up. Uh, they could use your data. Do you want to click these, you know, two boxes and also send the data to them? Like there, It sounds like to be effective, there has to be this back and forth where you're, again, your favorite communication to get these yeah. people to get the data out there, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so the, a couple of things happen there. One is we work with these advocacy organizations, so to speak, with their members to give, and those members often give very broad consent. So, you know, I'll use an example. It's um, it's a mom and a dad. Their kids hospitalized at Boston Children's. They have a rare disease. They put the bank, they put their bio sample and their um, clinical data for the kid into the system. And usually, those parents will say, "Please use my children's data for anything. They don't care." Um, and so we don't ask actually have a big communication problem with regard to then the two new institutions that pop up and need the data. Usually the parents have already given that permission. Um, we do have 
a more interesting um, uh, uh, kind of culture culture change work is when those parents are enrolling at Boston Children's to talk to Boston Children's about this is actually permissible. These parents can agree to have their data shared beyond the four walls of your institution. And while you don't like it that the data is going to go to Cincinnati Children's and Washington National and so on, um, the parents really want that to happen. And so sometimes we're fighting the institution instead, uh, but rarely does the, the donors almost always choose to share widely. No, that's good that they share widely, but let's say, you know, I'm going to, um, I don't know, you know, I respond to one of those commercials and I'm going to give money to, you know, a kid that's starving in Africa. You know, I want to see letters from the kid and I want to see what's going on and how my yep. contribution is helping. So I would think that that's great. They gave permission, you know, anyone can have the data, but it would be nice to have a reporting back to them. Hey, your data was used by these seven initiatives this year. And one of them led to uh, this new protocol. Like, I think that would, would help yes. by word of mouth to get other people to do it. And it would make those yep. people happy and it would be good. You know, I don't know if you yep. do that. I don't do it, but the disease groups do. So in other words, the good. National Psoriasis Foundation, the Ehlers-Danlos Society, whoever's in charge of that disease group absolutely does that. Yep. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, because that would give me the feeling, you know, if I did that, that I'm helping people without having to be a doctor and I can go about yep. my normal life, but yet I'm still, you know, my information is helping people, which would be a really cool feeling, you know? Right. Yep. Right. That's, right. that's, that's, that's a big part of the feedback. Yep. So what, what's coming up over the next, you know, one to five years that you're excited about? What's, what's happening and what are you working on? Probably the thing I'm most excited about is uh, we just formed a partnership with a company, actually a social benefit corporation called Luna DNA. Um, Luna is uh, enabling individuals to share genomes. So marrying our technology and their technology where we're enabling people to sell, send, uh, share clinical information and biological samples. They're looking at sharing genomes. Uh, marrying those two technologies together are very exciting for us. Luna has the um, uh, capacity to have investors involved because it is a corporation. We're not, you know, we don't have investors. Um, and the two together that, you know, they're trying to do social good. We do complete social good because we're a nonprofit. Uh, they are really, really savvy in the technology end of things. Uh, marrying these two projects together uh, I'm very, very excited about, and I think will make a, an enormous difference um, for us, for them, and for the people that we're serving. Yeah, I spoke to Luna a little while back, so that, that's great that you have a collaboration. It's excellent. Yes, very excited. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. So what's what are some resources for listeners? How can they find out more? And, you know, hopefully some yeah. listeners will want to contribute their information to your project. So. Yeah, sure. So the easiest way is a portal that we run that's pretty basic but very important called diseaseinfosearch.org. So all one word, diseaseinfosearch.org. And it lists the 10,000 diseases and people can just put in their favorite disease, you know, disease du jour, disease of choice, disease that unfortunately they've been affected by. And by putting that in this uh, search box, uh, all sorts of information about that disease will come up including a way to sign up for a registry for that condition. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I just pulled up the site. Okay, diseaseinfosearch.org, I got it. Yep. Well, that's great. Well, I, I, you know, Sharon, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got you know personal matters to attend to right away, but thank you for, uh, for doing this. It's been good. You're welcome. Thanks very much for your questions and your good work. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. 
You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.